Greg, Sana, mm -hmm. Michael, what else do we need to know uh, about rough translation? Now that I've got the title right, uh, and and for those who have come across the podcast for the first time, uh, do you have any other episodes that you would like to direct people to, or even give us a sneak preview of what's coming up in the next few months? Sure. Um, uh, I'll start. I'll start just by saying. Um, well, just to piggyback off what you said about the extraordinary and the ordinary, and you mentioned that a lot of the things that happen in, the, in this story are, are fairly ordinary. Somebody wants to build some pipes and has an encounter about pigeons, I mean, not to give away too much. But I think that balancing the ordinary in inter international reporting is something that, is so, that we think a lot about at Rough Translation. So one of the, just to specifically with this piece, the more obvious place, say, to structure this or, or to start the story would be with um, with the nurse, uh, Saror, the character, who's facing something that's very surprising. Uh, dead bodies on the streets that kids are walking by. That's immediately very shocking. And uh, even there's a scene with the foot coming out of the ground and well, who's going to who's going to clear the foot? And that would have been sort of a, a place to start. But the reason we decided to start where we did, which is just in a supermarket with a water bottle on the floor, even though it caused quite difficult because it's a different character and we had to figure out how to introduce that character, but then make the other. But the reason we wanted to do that is because it is so ordinary. Um, it, you know, it's just it's just whether people will walk by a water bottle and throw it out or whether, choice point. whether or the way they won't. It's a, and it's a choice point in the dramatic sense. Um, but from, from our perspective, it was also a way of saying, you know, it's actually an extraordinary moment because when someone throws a water bottle out in the place you are where you're listening, that's not a heroic moment. But here it's treated as a heroic moment worth applauding and being given chocolates and prizes. So why? why what is a, a place where even that small act of community um, service is treated as heroism? And then that would be the opening question of the piece, because ultimately what these characters are up against is many things, many things that we are familiar with from reporting. It is corruption. It is um, views on the roles of, of women in society. And yet, actually, speaking of the women thing, that is not as big a deal to Sarur's life because of the younger generation's attitude, as you might think. And so it's actually this deeper thing that, Jane was talking about, about the fear in one's eyes and the, the punishment for sticking your neck out in the past that does it apply to this new generation in the future. That's a very subtle idea um, that, we, that we explicate, but that was contained really in that opening anecdote, but in, in the balancing of the extraordinary and the ordinary. Um, in terms of upcoming episodes, I mean, look, uh, I always just have very short-term thinking. So we we uh, just released a trilogy that I'm very very proud of. It's called the School of Scandal, uh, and it's it's really it's about it goes to three different countries. Um, uh, let's see, China, India, and Uganda, where we are introduced to people who are um, breaking the status quo in ways that. Uh, you wouldn't have even known that that was the status quo was such. And and one of the challenges of our episode is trying to understand the of, of all our episodes is trying to understand the rules of a place and then how that character may be challenging those rules, breaking those rules, running up against those rules. Uh, and I think that that series uh, particularly does that. Great. And let me just second what what you said about that theme in, in, in the piece uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, this piece is not only about civic voluntarism uh, in, 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 in Iraq, but it's also about, and I found it as someone who had reported the Middle East, one of the most illuminating pieces I have ever consumed uh, in terms of the ordinary citizens um, very fraught, difficult, even dangerous uh, uh, relationship with government authorities, with the uh, es essentially uh, 
unlimited and always potentially arbitrary power of a police chief, uh, a soldier at a checkpoint, or in this case, the governor of entire of an entire uh, the city or the province. Uh, tell me if I've, I've got that right. But uh, the, so uh, it it um, it is a it is a subject that those of us who have covered authoritarian countries cover far too often in the abstract and by writing about it in these two individual cases it really brought home in a way what it is like to be an ordinary citizen confronting arbitrary power enormously powerfully i, I have a something to say about that i mean you know we've talked about how inspiring this story is and it is um these people are very, very inspiring. But I, I, I think if you think a little bit, basically just exactly what you're saying, if you, if you really look at the situation and the way that they're reacting to it, I think there's also really, you can really see the challenges that are facing these activists and the limitations in some ways of their vision. Um, and I, I know that's, uh, I don't wanna be a devil's advocate here, but there is, it's something that I brought up with them and have some very interesting conversations with them about that didn't make it so much into the piece, but they are so, so apolitical. They have, you know, Safwan in particular, I could totally see being an incredibly inspiring politician. He'll, just the mention of it, it's like he would recoil mm -hmm. with, with disgust. They don't have a vision for a political system that can work for the people. For, for a true you know, democratic vision of how you could rally the energies that they've sort of unleashed into that city into a way that will transform the public sphere. And that to me was deeply sad. I mean, if you look at the great you know, community organizers that of, in, a, in US history and, and the vision that they had to, to work with government, transform government for lasting change is not existent at all in this story. And so I think I would probably feel the same way if I'd grown up there, but it was uh, something where I kind of wanted to like, my brother is a community organizer. <laughs> I kind of wanted to get him on the phone and have him talk to us off on like, no, here's how you build power, man. Like, here's how you build power. What you're doing is great. You'll fix the water, you'll, you know, but working around the system of power is, is, is limiting. Um, so there's an interesting postscript as well, because the governor is the one who tried to arrest Sarur, and the governor is the one who held up a lot of things. And the governor is the one who didn't do anything about picking up the body. So um, just a few months ago, there was an arrest warrant issued for the governor for corruption. And he has, I believe he's fled. But even when we were interviewing him, he was like doing deals on the phone and he was on speakerphone and he was telling one of his aides at the time to make sure that he didn't approve any of the reconstruction contracts without his knowledge. It was extraordinary. And Shame. it was those little moments as well that, that said so much about what Mosul was like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, it sounds to me like it's time for an epilogue in that case on uh, on, on, uh, on, on the governor and the, f and the fact that he now has to flee. 